Johnson, I'm the city manager. Um, before we proceed a little farther tonight, uh, I want to just acknowledge we have Council Member P is here tonight uh, in the back of the room. Um, we have Jim Dantona for the Chamber of Commerce, and we have other staff from the Chamber, our partners from uh, downtown Swell, and we have a lot of your leadership team. Um, you're not seeing the full leadership team here tonight or the rest of the Council because Imagine we're this, we're a pretty busy city. So we have a planning commission meeting happening. Our police of chief, our chief of police is back in Wisconsin at the International Association of Police Chiefs. So we kind of are spreading uh, a little thin tonight. So, um, but we are prepared to answer any questions. Um, so with that, I think we're ready to roll the video uh, and welcome, and this will kind of encapsulate, and then I'm going to come back up and talk a little bit more about some of the key uh, milestones and some of the successes we've achieved over the last two years. San Luis Obispo has made great strides toward achieving our major city goals. We were not without our hardships over the past few years. Despite the challenges we have faced, 
we have endured and come together in times of crisis to emerge stronger, more resilient, and more connected as a community. I'm Rick Scott, Chief of Police of your San Luis Obispo Police Department. This year in 2021, our city, our community, and our police department were united in an unfortunate crisis when we lost Detective Luca Benedetti. I wanna thank you for honoring Luca and the whole Benedetti family as you honor his memory, as well as continue to share his rich legacy of service to our community for generations to come. Our community also came together as we navigated our way through the COVID-19 pandemic. Because of the efforts of the whole community, we kept our economy going and welcomed many new businesses with more on the way. And we didn't stop there. Thanks to the voter approved Measure G revenues, your community services departments are focused on managing and delivering the planning, design, construction, and maintenance of critical infrastructure projects, over $66 million this year. We're also building bridges, both literally and figuratively. We rebuilt the 100-year-old Marsh Street Bridge while preserving historical features and adding public art. In 2022, the city achieved a major milestone on the railroad safety trail, where we built a bridge across the railroad tracks and Highway 101. Facilities like this and protected intersections, protected bike lanes, and pedestrian hybrid beacons make it easier for more folks to bike and walk more often and do it safely. We've also been building bridges to assist our community members who are either vulnerable to or currently experiencing homelessness. Additionally, we've taken on a leadership role in developing a regional and city level strategic plan to address homelessness. We are designing our own future with a clear plan for population and housing growth. Most importantly, the city maintains a compact urban form, keeping development off of our hillsides and preventing sprawl through open space and agricultural preservation all along our borders. The city is also building a clean and sustainable water supply for the future. We're working on the largest infrastructure improvement project in the city's history. It will deliver significant long-term benefits to water quality, the environment, and water resilience. In 2021, the city also finalized and began putting into practice a 20-year plan for public parks, facilities, and recreation services in San Luis Obispo. And we're focused on bringing more park amenities and recreational programs and services to help build a strong sense of community. And what are parks without trees? Not only maintaining the 20,000 trees within the city limits, we're planting 10,000 new ones by 2035. We're also designing a future surrounded by wide open spaces that will stay that way forever. Last year, we opened the long awaited Miyosi open space and our amazing Slow Ranger service are building trails and bridges to make the space accessible to all. The city is changing the way we approach housing by ensuring that a percentage of all new homes built here are affordable to low and moderate income households. And in partnership with local nonprofits and the Housing Authority of San Luis Obispo. We're creating a mobile crisis unit to help members of our community who are experiencing mental health challenges. Our hope is that this program will be adopted by other agencies and scaled up to meet the regional need. The city is also leading by example with an aggressive goal of carbon neutral municipal operations by 2030. We are electrifying city vehicles and buses and introducing e-bikes into our fleet. We've installed battery storage at our water treatment facility and are investing in renewable energy and energy efficiency retrofits across our city facilities. Woven within all of these efforts are the steps we're taking toward making San Luis Obispo a more welcoming place to all. The city continues to develop programs and policies to support diversity, ensure equity, and practice inclusion. And there's still more to do. We're ready to roll up our sleeves and continue the work to make sure San Luis Obispo thrives and remains a place we all love.
Well, thank you very much for uh, spending time watching that. I'm really proud of that video, proud of the team that helped put it together. It has been a monumental effort over the last three years for us to deliver on our accomplishments. And so I'm going to walk you through some of the details uh, tonight. At the very end, we'll have an opportunity for some questions uh, from, from all of you. So um, there are a few things um, that are part of the uh, state of the city this year that we've accomplished so much more. Over the past year, uh, we've been united in times of crisis. Uh, we've built bridges and we've designed our own future, and we've taken steps towards meaningful change in our community. And I want to talk to you about all what this means. So, what has it meant uh, to unite in times of uh, crisis? Um, since the last time we presented, the mayor mentioned back in 2019, uh, we have collectively uh, faced fires, floods, uh, tragic losses, and a global pandemic. The one thread that I think holds true is that all of us have come together through this crisis, and I think in some ways it's brought us closer. Chief Scott mentioned uh, losing Luca, um, and on May 10th of 2021, our community lost a hero, a leader, and a colleague, and a friend. Uh, while serving a search warrant uh, in the city of San Francisco, Detective Benedetti, uh, um, who was just 37, a father, was tragically shot and killed. That day was very traumatic for all of us, myself, the department, and I think it sent a shockwave to our community. But in the face of the tragedy, uh, many of us united and we stood together. Uh, first, our city team supported our friends and our colleagues in the Slow Police Department, helping not only with the day-to-day -day tasks, but also with planning the organization for Lucas Memorial Service. Second, people from all life experiences showed up and supported us in to grieve the loss of a colony. Our community grieved and lost that of a trusted neighbor and a hero. We all grieved together. Luca made San Luis Obispo a better place, and he will sorely be missed. And I just want to share with everyone I had a chance, along with the mayor and myself, to travel back to D.C. Um, a couple weeks ago uh, for the enrollment of uh, Detective Benedetti and the uh, National Memorial for Fallen Officers. And I was, uh, will never forget the time that we were there and to, keep, to see our officers and for us to be able to lead together with other communities throughout the United States. Shifting gears, I want to talk a little bit about economic recovery. Our community also came together and we navigated our way through the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we made sure that businesses survived during a very tumultuous and unpredictable time by making economic recovery a priority and creating programs that help in a variety of ways. The city provided direct support to over 200 businesses. We created incentive programs that shoppers spent nearly $1.6 million over the closure with our buyback local program. Uh, we also supported uh, projects like the Mission Pop-Ups, which helped activate spaces so people could get together, but also patronize local uh, businesses. Uh, we also implemented a fast-tracking program for tenant improvements uh, for some of our vacant uh, spaces that the, count that the council funded. And during the entire height of the pandemic, uh, creative solutions for fitness were developed, for businesses operating in city parks. And we eventually reopened those parks and recreation opportunities and also included a child care. More on economic recovery, we invested $66 million in critical infrastructure, new bike paths, protective intersections, the maintenance of 135 miles of streets. And these projects facilitated economic recovery from the pandemic. They enhance safety, address past commitments, and partner in private um, um, development projects that deliver housing that also provide core infrastructure. We set aside funding and created grant opportunities to increase the number of childcare businesses in, in our city and our region. We are also working on developing a permanent parklet program. And we saw the success of our $1.1 million in investment in the Open Slow program at the height of the pandemic. All this is resulting in reducing our vacancy rate in the downtown from 12% at its height during the shutdowns to today, which is just uh, at 7% as of April 2022. 
These numbers are fairly impressive because 7% is what you see during normal economic times and because of the partnerships that we had that we're able to make this happen. Matt Horner, our public works director, has already talked about building bridges. And we spent those uh, during the pandemic uh, building them both literally and physically. We built the Marsh Street Bridge, the railroad safety trail extension, and we opened our safe a parking site at Railroad Square and rebooted our community academy. And if you're not familiar with the community academy, it's a way for us to build uh, and, and share information about local city government so we can get more engagement, perhaps participation in our committees and our commissions. We've also looked for safer ways to get around. Uh, I've mentioned the Marsh Street Bridge. It was completed in 2021, uh, uh, in January of that year. It's a significant connection and a major connection in the city of San Luis Obispo. It is uh, an historic bridge. Uh, it's really uh, part of our commitment towards downtown uh, vitality. Along with the replacement of the bridge, we also replaced the deteriorating sewer main underneath the bridge uh, so that we have a more efficient line. Uh, and to highlight this historical significance, we also uh, in, uh, provided a plaque and other details to help replicate the original kerosene lights. Uh, and also the guardrails were installed to mimic the historic structure. We've also extended the railroad safety trail. This is a legacy project. We've been talking about this for 20 years. And for those that you have enjoyed it, it is a significant uh, improvement for safety uh, and transportation to the Cal Poly uh, campus. Um, as gas prices have soared, we're seeing more people looking for alternative ways to get around our community. And the railroad safety trail provides that easy and safe route and reduces the amount of conflicts with motor vehicles. To give you a sense of how much it's already been used, in just two weeks just after it was open, we had 300 pedestrians and about 250 cyclists for a total of 2,500 trips that were used on that bridge in just a couple of weeks. And so those of you that had to walk and bike up through California, this is a much safer and also less stressful way to get to the campus. You heard Kelsey Nockett talk about uh, our efforts to address uh, homelessness. Um, and the city has been working with CAPSLO. We have Liz Steinberg, uh, the executive dir uh, director here uh, from CAPSLO, uh, to develop a whole host of programs, including an overhaul of the safe parking program at Railroad Square, uh, which is a safe and sanitary overnight parking for those who want to sleep in a vehicle. We've also added uh, new case management services along with that to provide a pathway to 40 Prado. We're working to rebuild and add to our community action uh, 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 team, which is our police department, which pairs up officers with a social worker. Um, and just to share some of the details around that, in 2021 alone, the CAT team engaged 541 people, and over 100 of those were treated for mental health, substance abuse, and other issues. We have a lot more work to do there. We're not done. We know the challenges about this, and we're looking forward to continued partnership and leadership from, um, from uh, the county of San Luis Obispo. Also want to share that through our Human Relations Commission, we have provided financial support to many nonprofit organizations with a focus on homeless prevention, support services, affordable and transition, transitional housing opportunities. And this last year, the city's Human Relations Commission had 30 applications for grant funding and recommended partial or full funding for 25 organizations. The city council provided 150,000 in direct general fund funding for those uh, organizations. And then as part of our ARPA allocation, the money that we receive from the federal government we're able to add an additional $100,000 for next year. So we know that there's a tremendous amount of need out there, and the council and the city have been responsive to those needs. So designing our future, we're also designing our future with a 20-year plan for public parks, facilities, and public recreation services. We have a clear plan for population growth that includes a clean, sustainable water supply for the future. 
In uh, 20, uh, the past year, um, the council adopted a blueprint for our parks and recreation uh, system. Uh, and that takes us through 2041. It is an essential guide for the future parks and recreation over the next 20 years. It's been, it is really designed uh, or guided by four uh, uh, real themes. Uh, design excellence, uh, making sure that we set a standard for excellence by creating engaging, long-lasting, safe, and sustainable park system. Stewardship and sustainability, making sure that we're conserving and protecting our natural uh, resource while providing opportunities for community to both support and learn from the natural environment. We're also leaning into our uh, goal on diversity, equity, inclusion. We wanna make sure we have inclusion and access and that cities, parks, and public facilities and amenities provide uh, uh, ways for a full diversity of our community to uh, benefit. Uh, we're also uh, building these parks and facilities to make sure they engage and develop uh, partnerships and public engagement. And so that we meet a lot of the unmet needs. The other piece is a good governance. We want to make sure that throughout the planning, throughout the process, um, that we're accountable to some of the decision makers and we're responsive to the community needs. And so one of the examples of that is we're planning Rigetti Park, which is going to serve the Orca area, which is one of the new uh, uh, development areas out of Orca and Tate Park. Uh, you also note that the city has developed a full and robust partnership with the Slow Museum of Art. You saw some of the murals up there. And we had, we've had uh, we seen some international artists visiting with sculpture pieces. Uh, we've seen uh, we see a temporary statue on the Sloma lawn and other installations that are planned in June. We're also planning for other art installations, installations around town, including the upcoming tank farm or cut roundabout sculpture. And we're also um, discussing other uh, opportunities for people to learn about the art that we have here today with some other map applications. So smart and sustainable growth, uh, we're designing our future and we have a clear plan for that population and housing growth. Uh, SLOW's um, population remains steady at about 47,000 residents. And what do, we can, what do we consider as we're planning that development growth? We're considering water. Even as California uh, enters its third consecutive year for a statewide drought, a recent report that was just presented to the city council shows that under extreme conditions and increased future demand, the city of San Luis Obispo has more than 10 years of water supply available. And that's really because of the long-term planning and the investments that rate payers have made. Our 2022 water and demand supply assessment confirms that the city has adequate long-term supplies and will continue to support the existing and planned growth in San Luis Obispo. We're also uh, making plans, uh, given the governor's uh, recent announcement, to make sure that we're also um, taking steps to make sure we're doing our part on a regional basis and everyone has a role to play to make sure we're conserving water as we continue to have a vibrant community. We're also making sure that we're addressing climate action goals. New housing that's being built in the city is generally all electric. Every home has a solar panels. We're making a compact urban form, keeping development off our hillsides, preventing sprawl, and making sure that open space is preserved. Speaking of open uh, space, um, the city has entered into a trail agreement with Cal Poly. And so in November, 2021, uh, we began work that allows for a connection between the city's Neosi open space and, and Poly Canyon. So imagine you'll be able to go from Stagecoach Road and be able to hike all the way into Poly Canyon. Um, and the trail planning and compliance were also completed in 2022. It also allows for additional trails over on the Red Rigetti open space, and which is in the Orcut area specific plan. And this will create another new entirely open space area within the city. We're also making sure that our open spaces that we own or we have easements on that we're responsible as landowners in reducing the amount of fuel. So there you'll see an extensive fuel reduction efforts are being done throughout the city. We've uh, replaced fences that have taken place in the Cerro San Luis Reserve so that we can reintroduce cattle uh, and grazing consistent with our uh, conservation plan. And you'll be seeing and have seen our ranger services 
continue to conduct open space maintenance uh, based upon our open uh, space maintenance plan to ensure compliance uh, um, through enforcement as needed. In terms of our urban forest, um, trees are a major focus at present. Um, the city recently completed an internal review and an organizational assessment of our urban tree program and looking at how best way to manage the 20,000 trees that we have within our inventory and then how are we going to then also plant an additional 10,000 trees by 2035. We partnered with EcoSlow and other community groups. We recently had uh, participation and support from Rotary de Tolosa uh, to uh, plant trees um, at the Johnson Oak Ranch open space. And so while these efforts are underway, we're remaining focused on maintaining the urban forests. Um, we've also ex uh, executed a multi-year agreement with West Coast Arborist uh, for tree maintenance services. And you'll be seeing some of that coming up in the next few weeks in the downtown. To help us also reach our goal of 10,000 additional trees, we partnered with the San Luis Obispo TBID uh, uh, with a program called Keys to Trees program. And we're dedicating 1% of our annual tourism revenue by planting trees in the community. And it's a groundbreaking program that I'm proud of and other communities are. So we are taking steps um, towards change and the city is changing the way we approach a lot of public uh, uh, policies, services, programs, and projects. And these steps are taking that have taken place over the past few years, past few years uh, are putting us on the path towards meaningful change. So when I talk about climate action and leading by example, we have led by example and we have a car carbon neutral goal of municipal operations by 2030. That is very aggressive. Um, our transit continues to be a key part of achieving the city's climate action plan. And our key updates of our climate action plan includes transit electrification. It's underway, and the city's first two electric buses will be delivered in 2022. The first bus is set to arrive in June of 2022, and the second is expected for delivery in fall of 2022. Concurrently, uh, our courtyard is having installed high power vehicle chargers. And depending on the construction on boarding, the first bus could be in service as soon as this summer. And so trans electrification is happening um, uh, throughout the city. And we plan to replace all 17 of our buses with electrical buses over time, which have a, should have a significant an impact not only on the environment, but also on the ride experience for, uh, for those who take transit, but also on the cost for, uh, for our system, having no longer the impact of use kind of so. We're also conducting a transit innovation study because we know that after COVID, we need to look at delivering transit services uh, differently. We'll be looking at on-demand deviated routes, micro transit, bus rapid transit, uh, which would be free to the user, uh, and uh, other ideas that will be updated in our short range transit. Given the substantial COVID impacts to ridership and labor shortage, shortages, the city has been unable to really make what we hoped for the last two years our progress on shortening transit headways. And uh, today, we're right now negotiating with Cal Poly, we hope to have a new agreement. Uh, in place to be able to put in place uh, routes and headways that improve the overall system. Also, want to share that uh, we're also working on resilient slow, and it's making made substantial progress on our climate adaptation and safety element of our general plan, which will expand the traditional public safety document to include issues related to climate change. Um, this is expected to be brought to council in the first half of 22. Everyone's interested in, in affordable housing. And in 2021, the city continued to implement um, a variety of housing programs, including making progress to updating our inclusionary housing ordinance. That is set to come to the council this summer. Um, but we do have a few projects um, that are underway, including the Toscano inclusion, uh, inclusionary housing project, the Broad Street Place, and the Courtyard at, at the Meadows. 
For the Toscano project in spring of 2021, the council approved the community development block grant of nearly $400,000 to assist the housing authority. This is a 38 unit, 100% affordable housing project. And the city also committed 335,000 of our affordable housing funds to the project and deferred impact fees of over $400,000. In December 2021, the city in Haslow, as well as other stakeholders involved in the project, we closed escrow, and I believe tomorrow we actually have a, a wall uh, raising ceremony uh, with our friends on the Toscano project. And so I'm very proud of this effort. On Broad Street Place in spring of 2021, the People's Self Help Housing Corporation received building permit issuances for a mixed use component for four residential affordable housing units. Uh, this is a 40 unit project, 100% affordable housing project. Sorry, sorry about the numbers, 40 units, uh, located at 3720 Broad Street Place. Uh, the development is adjacent to the Ironworks development by Haslow, so you see that project as you go down Broad Street. Uh, these, uh, these units will be reserved for extremely low, very low, and low income residents. And so we're continuing to make uh, progress. In fact, the recent report that went uh, to the City Council in April on our general plan annual report shows that we're nearly 60% of achieving our regional housing needs success. So we, you know, the goal that the city had of producing housing is actually having an impact. In terms of the courtyard at Meadows, uh, beginning in 2021, Haslow has finalized construction of the courtyard at the Meadows. These affordable housing, uh, this affordable housing project offers 36 new units, exclusively available for very low and low income families. These are one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom apartments that are in close proximity to South Hills open space and the Sarah Meadows. On mental, uh, on homelessness and, and mental health, um, I had a chance to talk with our chief, uh, our fire chief earlier today about our mobile crisis unit. Uh, we have hired an emergency medical technician to serve on the MCU. Um, and we've also hired a uh, paramedic we intend to launch the mobile crisis unit uh, on June the 6th. Um, and this is a partnership with Transitions Mental Health Association. Um, and we're excited about this. This is a way for us to divert calls for, uh, for homeless response from traditional police when there are no immediate health and safety issues to a paramedic and a mental health clinician. So this is gonna be a new model uh, for our region, a pilot program. You may have heard about this in other communities throughout the United States, um, up in Eugene, Oregon, up in Denver, and I'm really uh, thankful for bringing this model here. Housing for homeless and those with mental illness. In April, the city allocated $2 million of its city's affordable housing fund for two housing projects that will benefit community members uh, suffering from homelessness. Uh, $1.7 million um, of ARPA funding, the federal funds for, uh, for Haslow from the Anderson Hotel, and an additional $300,000 for Transition Mental Health Association for Palm Street Studios. And this is really housing types that will be available for those that are most vulnerable or on the streets and pairing uh, these units up with wraparound uh, services. We're planning to come back to the council on June 7th, uh, just in a few weeks, and with a recommendation on the 22-23 supplemental budget, and there'll be an additional allocation of funds uh, to look for affordable housing projects. Uh, also, as part of the major city goal, the city uh, again partnered with uh, Capslow and, pro and provided funding for a 25% expansion of the number of beds at 40 Prime. It's still not enough. I know that. I think we all know that. But it's it's progress and what we need to create options and capacity for those uh, that are suffering from homelessness. So with that, I'm going to switch now uh, to diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, and this is a new major city goal for our 21 to 23 uh, financial plan. And the goal is really about making San Luis Obispo a more welcoming place for all. And so that we have a true uh, sense of belonging. 
Um, we are embracing diversity. Um, we're working to ensure equity and, and focusing on inclusion. And so we've established a new office of diversity, equity, and inclusion. We have our very first DEI ma manager, uh, Dr. Bea Makakao. Um, and so her efforts and the efforts of uh, the office are to commit for meaningful and structural long lasting change. And we'll do this by uh, certain outreach activities, programs, policies, and other programs that are structured uh, to really address uh, racism and hopefully develop additional cultural competence within our organization and also throughout the community. We're also wanting to strengthen our relationship with marginalized communities and uh, their leaders. And we want to manage the city's comprehensive approach to improving, improving community-based and internal DEI initiatives. So you may have seen that we have a new uh, DEI program or series in which we're bringing speakers and leaders uh, into our community. Our first speaker that was just brought in last month was featured as part of Earth Week in partnership with the city's Office of Sustainability. It was also co-sponsored by the Cal Poly's Office of uh, uh, University Diversity and Inclusion and the Diversity Coalition. And it featured an MIT aeronautics professor, Dr. Daniel Wood, who discussed MIT's uh, Media Lab and, and applies space technology to projects that advance social justice here on Earth. It was a, a really a fantastic opportunity to learn about her research and the applied research that she does in innovation. And really, if, uh, for uh, a Black uh, leader who specializes in the leader in uh, engineering and science to come to our city and talk about her experience, um, Black women leaders in throughout American history, and relate that to her profession. So back to, to the goal itself. Uh, in fact, the city in the first year we've invested over 1.1 million in this effort through the grant program and to other local organizations. In fact, this summer uh, we'll be launching our $300,000 uh, grant program. Will be managed from the uh, Human Relations Commission to really partner with organizations to help advance DEI initiatives both in our city and throughout. So there's still a lot more to do, and you'll hear more about how we're building a lasting legacy and reducing homeless and making more uh, welcoming policies. Oops, that's that right. Yes. Um, and so building that lasting uh, legacy, uh, we had several significant le legacy projects uh, that are in the works. Um, the first one that I'm going to talk about is our cultural arts parking structure, formerly called our Palm de Pomo uh, parking structure. As the city of San Francisco develops its downtown core, uh, we need to integrate more ample parking. The parking structure will provide 403 parking stalls, a pedestrian path uh, to connect users to Monterey Street, vehicle entries and exits on Palm and Napomo Streets, and the structure fits within the context of the surroundings and preserves the existing large oak uh, on Monterey Street. The roof is being designed to accommodate event space, taking advantage of surrounding views of Bishop and Cerro San Luis Peaks. Uh, we'll have photovoltaic panels to help offset uh, energy needs. And the 100, and 143 stalls will immediately have EV charging capacity. Uh, in keeping with the city's goals, the site layout includes 5,000 square feet uh, for commercial development or housing and provides space for the new slow repertory theater, um, which the council, as part of its mid-year's budget allocations, provided nearly $4 million to help support um, the development of that long-awaited and long-needed um, addition to our cultural arts uh, district. Uh, we'll also be uh, working on public art promotional plan will be coming soon. And we're excited about SLO's unique public art and the city's public art master plan. We're also bringing forward into the future our kind of action plan uh, that will be updated in 2022 and presented to council in early 2023. And we're also preparing for the 2022 pedestrian crossing improvements project in the Cerro San Luis neighborhood Greenway project later that, uh, this year. We've also worked hard to create a sustainable, a financial stable future. The city has weathered financial challenges of COVID-19 
and we are in a very strong financial uh, financial position for the foreseeable future. Our financial uh, uh, forecast shows a balanced budget moving forward. And in February of this last year, the council adopted about $24 million on, in, in budget adjustments to help significantly pay down our pension debt sooner, advance major city goals, support existing services, and address emerging and community needs in, uh, for the future years. So what are we doing moving forward? Oops about um, homelessness. In the coming fiscal year, we're investing more than ever into policies and programs to increase housing options and pre prevent or reduce homelessness and slow. In 22-23, uh, the total investment uh, for housing and homelessness is expected to approach $27 million. Uh, this will help facilitate the production of housing, infrastructure with an emphasis on affordable and workforce housing. We'll continue to collaborate with local nonprofit partners, the county, the state, and the federal government to discover and implement comprehensive and effective strategy to reduce chronic homelessness. So what will it include? We'll see the update of the city's inclusionary housing ordinance. We'll be presenting and bringing forward for discussion the homelessness strategic plan to guide city's actions. We'll, have a, we'll be looking and in fact on June 21st, the county will be coming to the city council to talk about the regional plan to address homelessness um, that will really be the foundation for all the other cities in our region to address homelessness. We'll also be looking at ways to improve environmental protection and make sure that the water quality and cleanup of our creeks occurs and that our open spaces, public parks are accessible to all. And we'll also be looking to expand financial support for nonprofit social services that specialize in helping people transition now. In terms of making San Luis Obispo a more welcoming place um, for all, we'll be developing our DEI um, strategic plan, which will include assessments of city policies, our practices, um, the community needs, our priority and available resources. We'll be looking to the DEI recommendations from the task force that were presented to the council back in January of 2021. And we'll be looking to our internal DEI audit as a foundation and also be looking to Cal Poly, which is updating its analysis and assessment of the Cal Poly, uh, Cal Poly experience, specifically for reference and prevention. Um, we're focused on really making sure that, uh, that we have community. Uh, we'll be also be looking at policing and restorative practices. And so um, our police department has been looking to align our policies and our practices with national trends and best practices. We'll be looking to identify strategies and alternative methods for policing within the city. And we'll be looking at expanding social service providers to support uh, situations where police are currently serving as both responders and providers. And what ways can we get them, get our police department out of social work? We're also committed to maintaining our cultural competency training for officers, and we'll be seeking opportunities to strengthen relationships and intentionally center the needs of, of BIPOC communities. We also plan on expanding in the city's existing practices and programs and support development on leadership on inter internship programs, especially for youth, uh, BIPOC, and LGBTQ plus residents, and also increase the understanding, access, and participation in local government. Uh, we'll also be sponsoring public art and cultural activities that center the history, experience, experiences, and contributions of the city's historically marginalized populations. And we'll be focusing this on developing and generating a better understanding on the needs and ways to support the undocumented community. So as, as I wrap up for today, uh, I hand it back to the mayor to, uh, to close uh, today's presentation. Um, all of this could not have happened or will not have happened without the trust and confidence of our community. Um, I'm very grateful for all of uh, the trust that you've given us, the privilege that you've given us to serve this community during some very uh, challenging time, uh, times. Um, this is just a sample of what, of what we've done over the last few years and a sample of what's ahead. 
uh, and I'm extremely grateful for the, uh, for the all nearly 500 employees that serve the city of San Francisco and uh, over uh, 47,000 residents um, that um, have placed their trust and confidence in the city organization who could not have done or continue to do what we do without all of you. And so that will turn back over to that. Thank you, Sandra. That was amazing. As I said earlier, it's tons of information, right? Um, I, I, I have to also echo my thanks again. It's just really challenging times stopping and really thinking about what we do here at the city and what services we have available to a 47,000 um, city is kind of amazing. And I, I always think about you know our ridership for uh, buses and thinking about was it up two hundred fifty thousand people is our, our ridership worth versus the amount we have we have about a million riders about a year and about six hundred thousand of those we have more students or maybe four hundred thousand of our just yeah. so think about our little 47,000 person town is kind of amazing. Um, and I just, I really wanted to appreciate that you see from the end to appreciate this last COVID time period of we're, we're making it through and we're getting to the new challenges. So thank you so much. And I'll just open it up to just any questions. So I'm pressing some cards here. over here. You've got some questions, questions. and we can filter those up. Uh, with the article, I should mention that we have uh, this all happening online as well. So you may see some questions that come in uh, via Zoom. So you want to read the question here? So, what accomplishments are you most proud of in the last two years? Well, which slide should we pick? Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, really, I mean, I don't know if I just pick two. When I think about the work and what we're doing, not just that we're doing one of the largest projects ever and caring about beyond the work, our water and make sure that we have invested so much the years that we actually are in a place that many cities, not just throughout California, many cities even in our county aren't at. That's really amazing. Um, and I'm really also very proud of our community coming together and saying, we see that there's some challenges with not everyone feeling welcome. And let's go ahead and come together and talk about this. And talking about critical, um, critical issues and having those critical conversations are really difficult to do. So I'm just really thankful our city is willing to do that. Well, just comment in terms of the accomplishments maybe that I'm most proud of in the last year, I would say a couple. Um, one, I would say those my legacy projects. Um, and really the road safety trail that project um, really is a culmination of a lot of people. We stay on the shoulders of really people who get the foundation, but they didn't get into the for that. It was huge and we see big doubt up until literally sometimes the last minute. Um, I'm thankful for the bridge that we built in the downtown. Um, I'm very excited about um, the council's investments in our new office of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, I'm very proud of the fact that from January of 2021 to be able to stand up an office, hire a diversity, equity, and inclusion manager, to be able to then work with the Human Relations Commission to be able to pivot to look at new ways of distributing funds to help those um, that have historically been marginalized and have had access to needed services has been huge. Um, I've been Known to only one. It's also, um, you know, I'm really looking forward to what's happening. Is our MCU program? I'm really excited to see about our global crisis unit uh, program as well. I'm really excited. Thank you. Like I said, we have so much to be proud of. It's really hard just to keep it to a couple. So, what challenges are we most concerned about heading into next year? Which one? Um, I, you know, I, I look at, we have so many awesome infrastructure projects that we're, we're, we're looking at, but 
even just a couple of weeks ago, we found out you know our paving project is over over budget. You know the, the bids are coming in over budget, one point six million dollars. What are we going to do? And what do we have to? How do we to make trade offs to this this next couple of years? And supply chain is not a shock to anyone. Um, you know this has been a challenge for all businesses. And seeing how do we continue to make it through our plans, and then when we have to stop and change plans and, and evolve, that's a good thing, but it also gets to that moment when someone says, wait, but you were going to do this project over here, and how come you're not doing it? So I, I hope that we can, again, continue to open up communication, and I'm so thankful, you'll see Whitney Santisi in the back, and so thankful that we've added that communications um, growth here in, in this department, or sorry, in the city, because I think that the community needs to know all of the changes that we're constantly doing. My uh, perspective is more operational, as you can imagine, um, and, and my, I guess my challenge is to just on the field for how the department has to change today, it's people. Um, we're seeing the, the great reshuffle, the great resignation is impacting every sector of the economy and we're no different. Um, we've had a lot of transition, um, some of our departments have seen nearly 50% transition. Fortunately, right now we're seeing lots of good applicants that are very interested in public service, so that is very encouraging. Now, I would say the other concern is, is inflation and uh, what does that mean for our uh, for specifically developing or uh, delivering some of our capital improvement projects and what does that mean um, moving forward? We've seen some pretty significant, the mayor just mentioned that, some increases in some of our uh, uh, costs. And so that is something that we'll be closely uh, monitoring. I'm very thankful I have a very good uh, finance team that has been monitoring and modeling all this out. Uh, so that we're coming forward to council with what I would say conservative forecasts. Um, but at the same time, there's a lot of uncertainty in all to keep on. Thank you. I'm almost 50 in time classes. Um, are we doing anything to address mid income residents, housing, and affordable rents? You know, I, I think one of the greatest parts about the report we got in April actually was looking at the many different housing um, opportunities that are coming up. And that's from, you know, as we're talking about extra, extremely low to middle income and yes, to high income. So we have all different options coming on board and it's really exciting. So I hope that um, for those who are here and those who are online, you know, really go to the, go to the community development department, the, the GIS map and seeing what's coming up in these next couple of years is really awesome to me. Um, I, I would say uh, keep an eye out. There's a couple of programs that are underway. One, community development uh, is working on the missing middle, uh, which is the housing type that's really designed to get that housing segment that um, isn't low income or very low income, um, but at the same time can't afford market rate rents. And so we'll be looking at um, that specifically. Um, I would say probably in the next few years, uh, the city, and I talked to the city council about this uh, recently, is we're going to probably have to look at some of our underdeveloped areas, specifically Upper Monterey and the Hydera. Um, you know, those opportunities for us to, to work with property owners and see about potential infill development in those, in those locations. I think there's an opportunity to create some character development in a in neighborhood. And at the same time, you want to address housing. Next, we have lunch here. What are we doing to address the homeless problem in downtown in particular? Well, I mean, as, as mentioned earlier by city manager, our, our mobile crisis unit that we're putting into place is an amazing pilot program that we have really looked at, you know, from cahoots in Oregon to um, Denver, Colorado, and we looked at what is working in other areas that are dealing with our same issues. We're, we're not alone in San Luis Obispo or in California or in the U.S. Um, homelessness is a huge issue. And we're also, with this mobile crisis unit, it is not just pairing an EMT and, um, and a, a social worker, what it really needs is it's coming to the person where they're at and figuring out what they need. And what we've seen from other programs similar is we get to visit the person less times, but we can help them quicker, which I think is going to be really fabulous. 
Um, we also are continuing to work at, you know, we have the 25% increase at 40 Prado of beds. We have the medical assistance uh, treatment center at uh, also at 40 Prado that we've been a partner in along with the county and a couple of other cities as well. So I think helping with the mental health side, the detox side, and of course getting more housing, this is all going to be a really good combination. This is a, it's a complex issue and it's not one thing uh, that, you know, there's no, there's no, one plan that can make it happen. And lastly, I know that we are putting um, more uh, police officers on bikes in the downtown again, which I think um, being fully ramped up again with staff, which back to what Samantha was mentioning earlier, and we were at a 20% um, vacancy with our police department. And now we only get you know people downtown and seeing you see more often. I think it's going to be very helpful as well. We'll just expand on the mayor's response. What I indicated to the staff is um, we um, compassion, we need with compassion, but we also need to work. Um, and so that is the mantra that we're we, uh, moving forward with. So it's a combination of, uh, of leading with a lot of social services resources, specifically with downtown, with the partnership with downtown Slow and Cap Slow um, for a specific social outreach uh, and a worker in the downtown. Um, we have a variety of investments that we've made with downtown Slow to deal with cleanliness and hygiene in our downtown. Um, and we know long term that those are really handy uh, solutions. We really need to create capacity for housing and services. Um, and so if I could jump in there, one of the next questions is what is the role of the city and the county in terms of addressing homelessness, which is always a very important question. Because the city of San Luis Obispo, um, we're a municipal corporation. We provide water, wastewater, police, fire, you know, the rest of the services we talked about those. We all provide mental health services, alcohol and drug services, and other social services. Those are all done by the county. And those are really the services that, from my estimation, my experience, is really that will get at the root cause um, pairing of programs to help people uh, get out of the cycle of homelessness. We have a role to play. A role can be in terms of uh, public service response, partnering on affordable housing. We certainly provide us services or funding for social services because of how big this issue is and the impact it has on our community. We are doing things that just a few years ago I never thought imaginable, like hiring social workers or hiring or, or forming an and so we hope that these are proofs of concept that really show what the county can and should be doing um, throughout our region. Um, and it's an ongoing conversation. And I would invite you to come to the meeting on June 21st when the county is going to be coming to the city council and they'll be presenting their strategy that we hope that our strategy will fit in to make sure that they're trying to build the caps and services that are there today. <laughs> Well, it's 7 and 1, so I'm just you know, trying to keep on, on time, but I think we have time for one more question. And I will add, too, you know, the county coming together and actually looking at creating that homelessness division, it's really the first time we've done this. I don't know in how long, but I think ever. Um, 35 years. 35 years. Thank you, Vince. And I know that is going to be a way that we can really partner together. And I know that, you know, Council Peds and myself and the rest of the council members, we are constantly advocating how do we connect with the county and help them do their job in support of what they're doing so we can help our entire community. Part of being the county seat, it makes it a little bit challenging because all the services are here. We have, we have two more questions. And so um, the first one is on bike lanes. Just a question about the new bike lanes because we've got uh, new uh, bike, bike designs that are coming into the downtown. And so a question about those. I would encourage anyone who want to learn about the changes that we're making uh, in our downtown throughout our community uh, to go online and watch some videos about those solutions that they like things. And the essence is, is we want to have road rates that are available for everyone. So whether you're a pedestrian or a cyclist or a motorist, um, they are new to San Luis Obispo. They are not new to the world or new to our country. Uh, they have been around for a number of years. 
Um, so what the data shows is that it's going to take some time for people to use them. And over time, people will use them. They'll know how to recognize pedestrians. They'll know how to recognize cyclists. Um, what we do know is already it's reduced speeds. For example, on Marsh Street, we recently did a speed study and it's reduced the speed by nearly 10 miles per hour. Why is that important? Because the difference between 35 miles an hour and 25 miles an hour, if you get hit, is you may or may not live. Uh, and so that's why we're doing this. Um, and I know that it can be uh, that kind of change can be uncomfortable, but uh, at least what we understand is that over time people will adapt to this. I just want to encourage people to look at the active transportation plan. We recently approved that, and that is similar to that blueprint for the parks and rec. This is a blueprint for what's happening with um, all of the asphalt transportation. Whether you're walking or you're rolling in some way, shape, or form, um, this is what we're doing. So we are wrapping up because it is way past seven o'clock now. So um, we have some more questions, and we we'll happy to answer those in a later time. So feel free. You can always email council at slowcity.org to reach all of us at one time, which is kind of fun. Um, or what we have on our website, we all have our cell phones and our email addresses in a very transparent way. So we just want to make sure people know if they're trying to get a hold of us, it's, it's possible. Thank you so much for coming. We greatly appreciate your taking your time out of your day, and we hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you.